Uh, hi, this is my friend Dave Stewart. He's the owner, or I should say him and his wife Karen, own a health food store here. We'll pan around and show you where we're at a little bit. And on the corner of Hayden and Indian Bend Road here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And my friend Dave and I are both veterans from Vietnam era. I should say I'm a Vietnam era veteran where Dave was a real veteran. He was a Marine during Vietnam. And I've talked Dave into letting me record some of his experiences in Vietnam. So we're going to let Dave do the talking now and he can tell you he was a Marine and what rank he was. And we're going to talk about a certain story. Was it Hill 455? Oh, Hill 445? 445 okay. is the one we're yeah. going to record today. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, Dave, why don't you just go ahead and start and uh, uh, tell people what rank you were and where uh, you were in Nam, I guess. Okay, well, uh, I was I was just an E3, that's a Lance Corporal, so I was right. a nobody. But uh, by the way, the you graduate E2 from boot camp, folks. So let yeah, you know where actually, it was. I'm, yeah, so it was you know right. Yeah, but you know the way rank went in the military in Vietnam was if they had it, they gave it out. If they didn't have it, didn't matter. I you know. I was a squad leader and I was an E3, but rank didn't oh, really matter. So you matter. were a squad leader already at E3, Yeah, huh? it didn't matter. You know, if there wasn't any rank, you had to do the job. It was there and right, people right. Le exited early or for whatever reason, you know. You, Whether they were injured or mental or yeah, whatever, whatever, right? They, they, okay. Yeah, whatever it was. So Just like the stories you hear about World War II where you... Probably, yeah. You all, you went up the ranks by attrition. Just have to do the job. Somebody had to do the job. Yeah. The guy ahead of you was killed, and you were, even though you were a corporal, you were now you were doing now, a sergeant's job or whatever. Sure, that's that's the nitty gritty. Okay, so go and then we'll go ahead so, and hear what we'll talk about his. Oh, so anyway, uh, yeah, no, it was one of those things when, when I was. Uh, when I was in training, uh, they said anybody who wants to volunteer for recon, uh, raise your hand or step back or forward or whatever the hell it was. And I did it, and. Uh, probably saved my life because the grunts were getting wiped out big time. And recon was a little trickier because you went out in small groups, five, ten guys, or if you went on a combat, combat outpost, it was like 12, 15 of you. So, so and you, your main emphasis wasn't to get hurt or, or make contact, really. Your main emphasis was to find people. And, You're basically a and, forward uh, observer. And artillery right? or airstrikes in on them before, before they knew what the hell happened. You they know? were like a forward observer, they would call yeah, an army sort of, or sort, sort of? Yeah, sort of that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, recon teams sneak around in air, enemy territory and if they see something, then they call artillery or jets in on it. And, and the guys, you know, who are the victims of this experience, of course, they're walking along thinking everything's fine and almost hell blows up around them, so. Yeah, they can't things, hear the artillery going off. It just starts landing. Yeah, they, yeah. Well, yeah. The closer artillery is, you know, right, the less right. time you have. Right. If it's a hundred yards away. You can hear it screaming in over there. But well, it's right. That whistling sound they talk about. You hear it in movies. Yeah. The closer it gets, it gets right real quick and real screamy loud. And the, and the distance between the scream and the bang is real short. <laughs> yeah. But in any event, well, so we went on two kinds of uh, uh, patrols. You know, either we go and wander around for five, six days out covering territory, or they would take two squads and throw us on top of a hill and have us dig in. And we had to sit there for a week and look at the surrounding territory and sometimes direct infantry movements, you know. If we saw to something, we'd call the infantry in and they'd come and do whatever they did, you know. So which was engaged, of course, you know. When you, when you say the infantry, when you're ref and I notice in your reports they always say bring in the infantry. Is that referring to the Army? Yes, no. It was or your own infantry. infantry? Oh, your own Marine infantry. I was yeah. curious about that. Yeah, we were, we were in the Marine Yeah, it was all Marine Okay. Corps. So, uh, so I guess I guess the, the, the one little story I'm going to we'll talk about today is uh, this one hill. It was Hill 445, and I think uh, there was some evidence that there were it maybe had been mined, so... So this particular patrol, uh, we brought a couple of engineers with minesweepers, and we didn't find any mines, but whatever. So, uh, but I had a minesweeper with me in my hole. There was two guys in a hole as we dug our, our, our perimeter around there, and and I don't remember which night it was, but but uh, but we got, but we, you know, they typically would sneak up at night, obviously, because in the daytime you could spot them and call artillery in on, even though we did set pre-set artillery around us that fired every hour randomly throughout the night, but nevertheless, to kind of keep people away. But nevertheless, and we also put out little mousetraps, you know, a little pop thing with a string and claymore mines and that kind of thing to 
Oh, so it would be like a trip wire or something? And, and yeah. Yeah, and it would go pop. Oh, and just alert you more yeah, than just, kill anybody? Oh, somebody's, yeah, more than oh, kill okay, anybody. Okay, just, okay. Hey, somebody, somebody's moving up. Somebody's coming up. Okay, yeah, okay. so, uh, but in any event, so I think a couple of mouse traps went off. And, uh, and uh, all at once, of course, everything just explodes, you know. It, combat is like either, or war is like either totally placid, boring, nothing happening, or it's total freaking chaos, you know. I've heard the term 99.9% .9 placid, or what yeah, you were saying, and, and then the other one-tenth of one percent. Yeah, for a short period of time, yeah. Because sure. yeah. I, I read somewhere that most encounters probably lasted less than three minutes. Yeah, I don't know how long this went in, but it didn't last long. Five minutes. Five minutes. Know, ten minutes, you know. Yeah, I heard the term that it didn't take long to figure who had the most weapons, or the biggest weapons, is yeah, one way I heard it. Yeah, probably, yeah. So, uh... So in any event, you know, obviously, you know, we had, I had a couple of sandbags in front of this hole we, me and this guy were in, and, uh, and all, you know, there's a little grass, and this isn't really jungle, you know, maybe because of Agent Orange burning it off or whatever, there's low shrubs or whatever, you know, and, uh, and all at once, you know, you, uh, so anyway, they, when they hit us, obviously, they were throwing grenades, they were doing whatever they do, and of course, I was throwing grenades, you know, I, I was, I was lofting grenades out there. And then, uh, and then I saw some muzzle flashes. So I uh, happened to have my my AR-15 on, or, or my M16 on automatic, and I, and it'll empty out 20 rounds real, real quick. And so I, I ripped off the whole magazine and emptied it. So I popped it out, and I was reaching in in my doggy pouch to get another magazine out. And all of a sudden, I see some guy running at me at about 20, 30 feet away, you know, firing. And I'm trying to get the the magazine out of out of my pouch, but I can't get it out. And he's getting closer, so I, I reached down for a grenade, I pulled the pin on the grenade, and popped it right out in front of him nicely. But it wasn't a concussion grenade; it was a white phosphorus illuminating grenade. And so when the grenade went off, it blinded this guy, and he turned and went that way to to my left. And uh, curiously enough, we hadn't set things up too good because. The hole next to me, we had combined a radio man who has a 45 with this other guy who had an M60 machine gun. But when we got hit, one of the gooks had snapped, sneaked up and grabbed the M60 by the, and drug it away. So these guys, because they were stupid enough to set the M60 on a rock. So it was exposed, so the goop Is was, that the machine gun, right? Yeah, that's okay. an M60 with, you know, tripod. With a tripod, tripod. Okay, a okay, big right. old heavy thing with a right, big right. chain of stuff going in it. Okay. But they had drug it away. And so, uh, so these guys were left over there with a 45, and that was it. And well, this guy, he, he must have been hopped up on something because when we, when we searched him later, he had all kinds of weird powders and stuff. And, he, and so he, anyhow, he jumped in the hole with these two guys, and they had to stab him to death. And that's where the uh, when the, when you read the report and it said hand to hand combat, it was because this guy had jumped in to the hole next to me with the, and there was a great big Russian guy and a great big black guy, and they just did this guy a number with, and knifed him to death basically. And uh, and the rest of it, you know, just was. Uh, and then, well, there was other chaos going on, obviously. And, and that, the weird part about this particular patrol is we had a new lieutenant because of problems with the other lieutenant. But this lieutenant is, an, is, is a kind of a long-termer but never been in combat. And he came over there, and he wasn't even a recon trained, so I don't know what they put him But, you know, there was a lot of shortages, so people did whatever. And for some arrogant reason, him and the radio man, uh, another radio man, or uh, at the top, he had made the decision that they weren't going to dig a foxhole. So anyway, he gets shot in the head and killed, and the radio guy that was with him, the other radio guy, he got shot in the ass. So those guys, him, you know, bad decisions. <laughs> yeah, and, and I saw in the report that that was the one marine that was killed. That was the guy that, that, was, that killed. was killed. Yeah. And well, we had yeah we had yeah and then we had a couple you know several other wounded you know obviously because shit was blowing up everywhere you know it's kind of interesting Dave and I were telling this story well what led to all this Dave happened to give me some reports he had over something that happened an incident in his life 
And I started reading these reports, and Nick's saying one thing leads to another. I says, well, Dave, we're just going to have to start recording this, you know, get yeah, us there. Yeah, yeah. And in the report, I think, it, I believe it said 14 or 15 yeah, they were confirmed curious. killed. Yeah, but there was really, you know, oh, I think, uh, you know, well, I think they had, they had a publication in Vietnam called, I don't know. Stars and Stripes we had. Maybe when I, it was Stars and Stripes or something like that. Right. And I remember seeing a headline in that 15 VC killed hand-to-hand -hand stuff. And stuff. I was telling Dave, I stationed Hawaii during all this. It was this. a little bit of an exaggeration. Yeah, and we would get kill reports in the Stars and Stripes on a regular basis. Yeah. And, and yeah. they always try to emphasize for every one of us we killed 10 of them. Yeah. And, and what Dave has confirmed to me is that uh, stuff might have been a bit exaggerated. It, it probably was. Probably exaggerated. And, and, and I noticed that when they would call in our artillery strikes in the reports mm -hmm. well they would say uh, six VC killed probably, probably yeah. you know how would they really know no you wouldn't because these guys we were you know we probably were a quarter few hundred yards away, a few hundred yards away right calling yeah. in well, we, no, you weren't on top of them calling in artillery no, we were know. on a hill somewhere looking down and we saw people moving through a valley or something you know so so, so that's and, and oh, Dave explained you how the hills got their names. Oh, oh, yeah, they were. It was just how high the hill was in meters. Yeah. So. And interesting, meters and not feet. I think they use meters. Yeah. Well, I, your reports say meters, yeah, yeah, and, and meters. I found that kind of interesting because yeah, I, we adapted to the the metrics. Well, system. they were trying to force us all to adapt back in the '60s and '70s. Oh, or try, remember there was, was the thing because yeah. I was an electrician. All of a sudden, we started getting tape measures. Mm -hmm. When I got out of the Navy after the NOM thing, we started getting tape measures that had meters on us, and they told us they were going to make us all convert to the world, no, part of the New World Order, as I call it, no. and, do, and start with the measuring system. We'd all use meters. But you couldn't convert a bunch of dumb electricians and construction workers to start using, yeah, I built this shack 15 meters high. It, yeah, just, there you it, go. it, it was not going to work. And so that all came to an end. Yeah. So in NOM, they used meters. Right. So. so Go ahead, Dave. Oh, okay, yeah. One other peculiarity. I mean, you know, it just shows how human war is and how pe peculiar the mistakes are. Because I had a, I had an engineer with me. You know, this is a non-combat guy who just happened to get sucked along on this patrol because we needed somebody with a minesweeper. And so after the whole battle was over, I say, "Hey, how come you didn't shoot that guy that was running at us?" And he goes, "What guy?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, his eyes closed. Always bothered me. He was like, "What was he doing?" <laughs> his eyes were closed. Maybe? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, shock. He, he never saw the guy. I don't know. It was very peculiar. Afterwards, he <laughs> Yeah, and when when uh, he says that an engineer, they well, I don't want any more non-combatant types with me. Yeah, because he here. might have been a troll. Well, so, so people know that would have meant he was a. He could have been a backhoe driver or something he, like that. Yeah. He, um, I forget what we called him in the navy. Uh, I can't think of it right now, but that would have meant that he was uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't combat. He wasn't he out there. Been he, trained he hadn't been trained. Yeah. And, and Dave has an interesting story I heard from his wife after he got out of the service. I guess you were going to go to California, and you were just yeah. married or something like that. And you're going, what were you going to do? And you're discussing it, and you, know, you hear a lot of these stories. And Dave goes to Karen. Well, I'm a trained killer. So maybe we. Do you remember uh, that story? Yeah, that had yeah. been a well, lot of know, years ago. You know, when I got back from Vietnam, I was. I couldn't feel anything. You know, it's curious. You know, life's an emotional journey, and and you spend a year in terror and fear all the time. It becomes kind of like a, a way of life, and you all at once, you know, and that was you know probably like these guys in Iraq enough. You know, one day you're over there and then. Next day, a 747 zips you halfway around the world, and you're back here where in America, and you know, it's very peculiar. Hey, I got a grandson then, in Afghanistan who's yeah, experienced of exactly what you're talking. He's a corpsman. Yeah. yeah, and I spent I, well, I spent a good 10, 15 years without being able to express any emotion at all. You know, there was no emotion. It was just like I don't know. Oh. You're hardened. You just, I guess you were just so hardened. You were just hardened. And whatever it was, there was, you know, probably uh, most people thought I was probably very peculiar because I couldn't get, I couldn't get upset about anything. You know, even when I, I remember some girl getting upset and crying over her football team losing, and I, you know, it just was couldn't relate to that. But yeah, to me, you know, yeah, right. wait a second, there's people being killed over here, and you're 
crying because of a football team losing, you know? Like, like oh, what do you do with this, you know? Uh, this is going to be just one video. We're going to do a series of videos with Dave here. We'll just call this part one. But okay. interesting little antidote I want to add to this. Uh, Dave was telling me about, I guess, when you're first stationed over there and that you went into your verse, first hooch, would have been a Vietnamese, South Vietnamese home, right? When they called hooches? Uh, well, you know, they were, I mean, you know, this, this is, uh, this, the, you know, it's hard to imagine people living without running water and without real furniture and without, the, with, I mean, you know, we were talking a grass hut with a wooden floor and maybe one or two pieces of crudely carved wooden furniture. Yeah, you know. It, it, well, the interesting to me is you said where you went into one of these and I remember the term hooch for some reason, and I don't know if that's the right term, but anyway, you were saying, to me, you said, first thing you thought to your mind was, what am I doing here? Yeah, you, it was you, very peculiar, because I mean, well, the you, reason Because they we, didn't have anything, and you mentioned that, hell, yeah. the people didn't have no furniture or nothing, you know, and they had a dirt floor. Yeah, well, the reason, only reason I was in it was, sometimes you would go through, you know, you'd be on a patrol, and you'd walk through a village, and there would be people, you know, the old ladies and stuff sitting there doing their rice or whatever, you know. And sometimes the Vietnamese people were, if they thought the 